Well, hello. We're at home again. Service on a sofa. Uh, yeah, we couldn't really make it to the church today, so uh, this is where we are. Let's sing our first song together, a number 1134. 1134, you are my anchor. There's lots of different names that we can give to the Lord and lots of different ways we can think of him. But uh, this song is telling us that he keeps us safe and he holds us in the same place rather than have us drifting around all over the place. So uh, here he is number 1134. thought I was going to say the rain is coming down but the rain isn't coming down at the moment so uh, don't need an anchor in that sense but in every other we do we need the Lord to hold on to let's come to the Lord in prayer gracious heavenly father we thank you for your living mercies to us every day thank you Lord that uh, you're not looking on past glories and seeing the different things that uh, you did years ago but Lord, every day is uh, a new step along the path with you. Pray, Lord, that you give us grace to walk that disciple path with you, to follow on with you every day through uh, low points and high points, uh, through difficulties and times of ease and rejoicing. Father, we thank you for our friends. Thank you, Lord, for the people that you've brought into our lives. We thank you, Lord, for family that means so much to us. Lord, we thank you most of all for the Lord Jesus Christ, who has loved us better than a family member, who has been kinder to us than the dearest friend. Thank you, Lord, that he is faithful to us, more so than a spouse. We thank you, Lord, that his attention never wanders from us. Thank you, Lord, that he never thinks of another. He thinks only of those who upon whom he has set his love. So, Lord, we want to thank you for our Saviour, 
We ask our God that uh, you'd speak to us today through him and encourage us uh, to live our lives for you during the week through what we hear here. So, Lord, uh, bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our first reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. Matthew, chapter 16, from verse 21 to 28. And it's under the heading of Jesus predicts his death, but that's not really why um, I was turning to that, but uh, something that he actually says towards the end of the passage. Okay, Matthew chapter 16 from verse 21, first of the four Gospels. And in chapter 16, we read, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Well, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they've done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, that's pretty amazing. The Lord should say that. He did say, take up your cross if you're going to follow me. That's what I was looking at okay our next song is number 224 224 it's kind of the pilgrim's progress hymn so i don't really know if it has too much of a link with pilgrim's progress but john bunyan wrote it so um i think just about everything he does is kind of linked by people retrospectively with pilgrim's progress but i don't know that it is That's another hymn that could do with more verses. We need more verses. They're just singing it, just getting into it. 
it stops. <clears throat> okay, our next Bible reading is from 1 Kings chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter 1. And um, we're looking at Adonijah. Remember the son of David who wanted to be king. Yet another son of David who uh, wants to be king. Adonijah. Yeah, I remember his name, um, how to say it and everything, because uh, it says that Adonijah is a very, very good looking, as people might say, like an Adonis. Adonijah. There you go. So uh, this is 1 Kings chapter 1, uh, from verse 7 to 15. Okay. So in the first few verses, we heard about David, who couldn't keep warm at night. So he was given additional help by Abishag, a Shulamite. Uh, but Adonijah, he saw that his father was weak and um, he thought, now my moment has come. So he declares himself the new king. Here it is, 1 Kings 1 verse 7. Adonijah conferred with Joab, son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar the priest, and they gave him their support. But Zadok the priest, Beniah, son of Jehoiada, Nathan the prophet, Shimei and Ray and David's special guard did not join Adonijah. Adonijah then sacrificed sheep, cattle and fattened calves at the stone of Zoheleth near Enrogel. He invited all his brothers, the king's sons and all the royal officials of Judah. But he did not invite Nathan the prophet or Beniah or the special guard or his brother Solomon. Then Nathan asked Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, have you not heard that Adonijah, the mother of the son of Haggith, has become king, and our Lord David knows nothing about it? Now then, let me advise you how you can save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Go in to King David and say to him, My Lord the king, did you not swear to me your servant? Surely Solomon your son shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne. Why then has Adonijah become king? While you are still there talking to the king, I will come in and add my word to what you've said. So Bathsheba went to see the aged king in his room, where Abishag the Shunammite was attending him. Bathsheba bowed down, prostrating herself before the king. What is it you want? the king asked. Leaving you on a cliffhanger. So you've got to watch next week as well, see what was going on. But um, that's a great place to leave the story. Um, so during the course of this week, um, more lockdowns up north. Now there's lockdowns coming in um, in London and uh, things are tightening up because the numbers are getting quite high and, and England's in rate of infection is going up and everybody's going to be wondering what's going on at Christmas. And, People are concerned about this, that and the other. And um, so there's a lot of anxiety in the world. And um, yeah, we're down to 14th, the 14th most infectious cases, uh, the 14th most cases of COVID in the world. When we were up to eight, eighth highest, now we're only 14th. But uh, perhaps we might creep up again. Uh, we should be praying about such things and... Uh, we can pray too about the, the church building as we've got uh, electrical issues there and uh, we need to get those sorted out if uh, we're going to go back in there. Let's come to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, as we come to you, you've um, set your love upon us. Uh, Lord, we thank you that um, you've made us your joy and your crown. Well, we can't believe it, but there it is in the scriptures it says that you will sing over us. And Lord, uh, this is amazing to think of. And we read in the book of Revelation of the wedding supper of the Lamb. And uh, in the Song of Solomon, we are presented as the bride uh, of Christ. Lord, that uh, you should lavish these things upon us, these expressions, these thoughts. Lord, it, it's amazing to us when we look back and we see how faithful we have been to you. And uh, Lord, how much we sin each and every day. 
And yet there's this passion for us. There's this great love for us manifested in Calvary, but manifested every day of our lives as well. Every time we see sin held back, we know it's because of you. Every time we see a good gift come anybody's way, we know it's from you. Lord, you are the source of every good that there is. We praise you, Lord, this morning, because you are what lies behind the kindness found in any man. We praise you, Lord, that it's because of you that we see generosity in people. Um, it's because of you, Lord, that we see any virtue at all in any man. And we tremble to think of uh, the final destination of the lost, where they shall be in a place where your goodness is removed uh, and they shall be left to their own devices. And there shall be suffering. There shall be loneliness and enmity and hatred. There shall be no friendship. People will not rejoice with their friends and have a party in hell. There will be no friendship in hell. Father, we want to thank you for your goodness to us then. And we praise you for it. And we pray, our God, that others should see and live. And others should rejoice over the good in the world, but more so over the one who sends it. Thank you for your empowering love. Thank you for your restraining hand. Thank you, Lord, for your divine providence that sets everything in the way that it's supposed to be. Thank you, Lord, for your patience for us, Lord, and, uh, and your knowledge of the future that you have given to us, at least partially, that certainly the Lord Jesus shall win and every foe shall be vanquished. Just as death has been defeated by the Lord, so shall every enemy be defeated. We don't have to worry about the, uh, the rise of wickedness. We don't have to fear uh, about the causes around us. We just need to trust in you. We need to walk in faith and not fear. And we pray our God that you give us grace to do that uh, so that we can trust you and so that we can let a whole th load of things go that the devil tempts us to hang on to and to worry about. Lord, help us to let them go to you and know that we can trust you to take care of those things. Pray for those, Lord, who are feeling poorly at this time. Pray for those who are worried. Pray for the anxious. Pray for those who have had some of their freedoms curtailed. Pray for <coughs> others, Lord, who dread that that might happen to them. We bring them all to you, our God, and we seek Lord, your mercy for them. We seek, Lord, your kindness. You know, the greatest thing that people need is to know the Lord Jesus. So we pray that, that there should be widespread knowledge of the Saviour, that many, many should come to him and should love him as they have been loved. I pray, Lord, that you would use us in that respect to play our small little part to pass this message on. Be with us, we pray, each one of us. Help us to trust you when there are worrying things said to us, when people say things that uh, give us concern, or help us to unburden ourselves upon you, knowing, Lord, that you care for us and that you've care carried our burdens for thousands of years before that we've even know what they are. Thank you, Lord, that you've always known, that you've always cared. And, Lord, we can leave the outcome to you. Lord, bless us and help us to lean upon you this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, one more song before I talk about this, and that's uh, number 1139. 1139. You chose the cross. It's a great song. All right. Death. You chose 
week um, something of what it was like um, in the time of David um, things were not the same as they are today an attractive girl could be pressed ganged into keeping the king warm at night and maybe try and spark some life into him as well not every girl's first choice then the son of the king Adonijah put himself forward to be the replacement king whilst David was still on the throne. David had made a rod for his own back in a way by never reining him in and disciplining him for his bad behaviour. But now here we are in dangerous times. And you might think that uh, you'd have a pretty sweet life being the son of a king, but that wasn't always true either. Seven male descendants of Saul were killed for his sins against the Gibeonites. Why? Because they were the sons of Saul. Ahab's 70 sons were killed after his death, purely because their father was so evil. You wouldn't want to have been one of his 70 sons. Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, his sons were killed before him, and then he was blinded. And so his sons dying, a nasty death, was the last thing he ever saw. The last king of Judah, punished by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Well, this isn't a very original thing to say, but don't wish that you had somebody else's life. You can be sure that they have better health than you, maybe at the time, or more money than you, or maybe more friends than you. 
but you don't know what comes with all that. You don't know what it means to have all those things, the whole life that that person has. Happiness isn't about simply what you have or what you achieve. Look at the famous 27 Club. Uh, people speak often about this. Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jim Morrison, Kurt Cobain, Robert Johnson, Amy Whitehouse, and Jade Goody. All of them died when they were 27, and you might have thought that they all had something going for them, and you might feel like you have nothing. But don't try and walk in the shoes of other people, because you might not like the direction, the direction that those shoes are traveling in. Today, we're going to find out a bit more about Prince Adonijah. Uh, people can say that you can find out a lot about somebody by the friends that they have. Um, Proverbs 13, 13 says, walk with the wise and become wise. Um, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Well, you know, that's quite similar to what I was saying. And you expect to see a foolish person who makes all his friends fools. Um, you expect to see a wise person whose friends are all very bright and sharp. Adonijah knew he wasn't ever going to become king just on his own. He needed sponsorship. Sponsorship is a great idea. Um, attendees of AA have sponsors, people who take them under their wing and try to make sure they're okay and don't slip up. Uh, back into addiction again. Football clubs have support uh, sponsorships. Uh, the biggest sponsorship deal in the world right now is with Real Madrid and their deal with Adidas. Uh, they get £950 million over 10 years with £70 million a year for their names on their foot, their name on, on their football strip. Do you know what? If Adidas wanted to print their name on my shirt, I think I've let them do it for 70 million. Adidas, are you watching? Adonijah was looking for sponsors um, or endorsements from people to give his claim to the throne credibility. And uh, you can see on here just the people that he picked. And uh, there we are in verse 7. Adonijah confirmed with, conferred with Joab, son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and they gave him their support. Um, when he was looking for support, he was going to have to be quite careful because he needed people who had a lot of credibility with other people and who might be motivated to back this new unknown horse. But also he didn't really want to have people who are going to be um, stirred up to oppose him, actually doing more harm than good. So he picked quite wisely, as we shall see. He picked Joab and Abiathar. Joab was, as we're told here, the son of Zeruiah. Zer Zeruiah. Well, that was David's sister anyway. So actually, he is the nephew of David. Joab was not the most godly of men. He was a bloodthirsty soldier through and through. And he believed strongly in getting the job done. That's... Uh, actually relevant to one or two of the other people we're going to be thinking of in a minute as well. But uh, Joab believed strongly in getting the job done, whatever it cost the other person. Uh -huh. David made Joab the general of his army. He was overall in charge of all the army of David. But when Abner, who was a cousin of Saul, so he's kind of descended from the wrong line there, a former commander of Saul's army... Um, when Abner killed one of Joab's two brothers, Joab killed him in cold blood and David was not happy because Joab there is killing kind of royalty, you know, somebody in the, the Saul royal family. But Joab did that purely out of revenge to get the job done no matter what the cost to somebody else. Joab helped David organize the death of Uriah the Hittite who was Bathsheba's husband. David was um, David committed adultery with Bathsheba to cover it up. He killed her husband. Joab helped him do it because, again, it gets the job done. 
despite the cost to anybody else. Um, the time came when Absalom, uh, the son of David, rebelled against David. David gave explicit instructions to keep Absalom alive when they chased after him and caught him. Whether or not that was a wise thing or not, Joab wasn't listening, and so he uh, speared Absalom to death when he was hanging by his, his... He was caught up in a tree, and he put a spear in, and the other soldiers did as well. And he reported back to David, and David was furious, very upset that uh, Joab did that, getting the job done despite the cost of other people. Um, David replaced Joab as the leader of his army with Amasa. Amasa. That's who he replaced Joab with. What do you think Joab did? Joab killed Amasa and got his old job back because that's the way that you do things. You do them when they, uh, they cost other people things, but not yourself. That's Joab. So you can depend on him to get the job done, but you don't want to look too much at the morality of the way that he did things. Now, the other person he chose to help him, well, the Doniger, he, uh, he asked Abiathar the priest. Abiathar was the great, great grandson of Eli the prophet, which is quite something. That's quite a lineage he's got there. Um, he was, Abiathar was the only priest to escape from Saul's massacre of the priests at Nob in 1 Samuel 22. As such, he must have seemed like a very godly man because he's got that history behind him. He's got that preparedness to stand up against Saul behind him. Uh, surely he's got a lot going for him. Um, certainly he was trusted by David. Uh, 1 Chronicles 27, 33 to 34 says, Ahithophel was the king's counsellor. Hushai the Archaic was the king's confidant. Ahithophel was succeeded by Jehoiada, son of Benaiah, and by Abiathar. Which means that David had Ahithophel to be his counsellor, Ahithophel, it didn't really work out with him. And so he was replaced by uh, Jehoiada and by Abiathar. Abiathar became one of the king's counsellors. So that's one of the most trusted positions you could have, that he had the king's ear. He was much more than just a priest. He was a counsellor to the king. And he came to David when he was in the cave of Adullam, when he was hiding from Saul, and he served him faithfully ever after. And uh, so that was good. So quite a shock, really. When we think of uh, Abiathar being one of the guys that um, uh, Adonijah would turn to. Now, I'll be speaking about Zadok in a minute because he's in the, the next list. But actually, Abiathar and Zadok were mentioned several times in their joint service, even though they end up on different lists, as we shall see. Uh, 2 Samuel 15, 24, Zadok was there too. And all the Levites who were with him were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They set down the Ark of God and Abiathar offered sacrifices until all the people had finished leaving the city. Two of them working in tandem. Um, 2 Samuel 15, 29. So Zadok and Abiathar took the Ark of God back to Jerusalem and stayed there. 2 Samuel 15, 35. Won't the priests Zadok and Abiathar be there with you? Tell them anything you hear in the king's palace, we read. And 2 Samuel 20, verse 25. Shh. <coughs> Excuse me. Sheva was secretary. Zadok and Abiathar were priests. So they're, they're mentioned in the same breath. Uh, quite often, the two of them. And it's sad, really, to see in the context of this passage in 1 Kings 1, the two of them set against each other, backing different horses. A pretty impressive couple, um, Joab and Abiathar, a soldier who stops at nothing, a man of violence that's uh, respected or feared by all, and a priest known by his association with David and uh, prominent in the worship of the Nathan, nation. So people are going to look at those two and say, well, you know, he's got some uh, significant support there. Uh, the leader of the army and one of the leaders of the priests but I look at those two and I'm filled with sadness as I, 
I trust you are as well. These were tough days and um, we're not expecting to see in 1 Kings apostles um, or people filled with the Spirit of God, loving each other sacrificially, concerned with all of God's laws and worshipping him in spirit and truth. Um, that might be a lot to look for here. It's there in the New Testament. And uh, on Wednesdays, we're looking in Acts, and that's what we do see. Um, God's people change, transformed into that kind of behavior. We're not really expecting to see that here, but betrayal by these two comes really as something of a blow. One so strong physically and the other strongly linked with the worship uh, of the nation. And this must have, when he finally hears about it, it must have hit David hard. And um, that's that's a sad thing. Um, also, we're given a list of those he did not pick. And uh, that's found there in verse 8. But Zadok the priest, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, Nathan the prophet, Shimei and Ray and David's special guard did not join Adonijah. Well, he may have sought their help and they turned him down or he may have thought, no, I'm not even going to ask him. But these are significant people who did not back uh, Adonijah. Um, were, were they not asked or did they refuse? Well, we don't know. First of all, on the list is Zadok. Um, he wasn't just a straightforward priest like Abiathar. Uh, we find about Zadok that he was the high priest. So he's the rank above Abiathar. He had been under David and um, high priest, and, and he would be serving as high priest under Solomon as well. Uh, he was there for the long haul. Uh, he officiated at uh, Solomon's coronation. He would do. Chronicles describes his ancestry as going back to Aaron. Do you remember I told you that Chronicles describes the ancestry of Abiathar going back to Eli, which is very impressive, but it makes the point of actually taking um, Zadok's ancestry back to Aaron. So he's actually got a, a superior pedigree to that because Chronicles wants you to look at the two and see one is a better man than the other. Uh, it's a means of inferring the superiority, superiority of one over the other. After Saul's death, David took the crown and stayed at Hebron, where he assembled an army. Interestingly, in 1 Chronicles 12, we read who came to join him and from what tribe they hailed from. Um, 1 Chronicles 12, verses 26 to 28, it says, from Levi, going through the different tribes, and then we get to Levi, from Levi, 4,600, including Jehoiada, leader of the family of Aaron, with 3,700 men, and Zadok, a brave young warrior, with 22 officers from his family. And we don't know for sure, but Josephus, the Jewish historian, was convinced that this was our man. This man who joined David at Hebron when he was first assembling his army. He brought some warriors with him. And it's acknowledged that he's from the tribe of Levi. So um, it may have been Zadok, not just a priest, not just a high priest, but he's also capable of making good choices, a loyal man, maybe even a warrior priest. OK, so there's Zadok. Then there's Benaiah. Benaiah, he was one of David's so-called mighty men. Uh, he attracted attention by his brave acts he stands out from the crowd uh interesting stories that they tell of him he once jumped into a pit on a snowy day and he killed the lion that was in the pit almost the definition of extreme sports you don't do that kind of thing you you walk around the pit don't you he jumped into the pit and killed the lion also in battle he was facing a massive Egyptian soldier, apparently he was a very, very large man, who had a huge, great big spear. Um, Benaiah managed to grab the spear off the Egyptian and kill him with it. That too, feat, uh, feat of heroism, uh, sort of made him stand out from the crowd somewhat. And so he had that recognition of being one of David's mighty men. There's 33 of them. 
he put him in charge over his guard and uh, he was a soldier through and through not a greatly sophisticated man he was responsible by the end of the whole big long story he was responsible for the death of Adonijah and Joab and Shimei who we've yet to mention there's Benaya for you tough man Nathan is up next he's mentioned on the list as well he's a very capable man being responsible for court records apart from anything else 1 Chronicles 29 29 as for the events of King David's reign from beginning to end they are written in the records of Samuel the seer the records of Nathan the prophet and the record records of Gad the seer so with uh, Gad and uh, Samuel he kept court records of the events of King David's reign not only that 2 Chronicles 9 29 as for the other events of Solomon's reign from beginning to end are they not written in the records of Nathan the prophet in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite and in the visions of Ido the seer concerning Jeroboam son of Nebat so there he is he's a court chronicler he's somebody who actually wrote down the details what happens in his reign who knows maybe to some extent they've been uh, referred to in the writing of uh, Kings and uh, Chronicles as well Nathan an able man kept records also contributed to the worship of that day in 2 Chronicles 29 25 he stationed the Levites in the temple of the Lord with symbols harps and lyres in the way prescribed by David and Gad the king's seer and Nathan the prophet this was commanded by the Lord through his prophets so he's actually via prophecy instrumental in some of the music that was going on in worship as well creative man isn't he so he's doing all of that but apart from that Nathan is um, perhaps known best for his prophetic uh, words he was the one whom David spoke to when David said you know here I am living in this fine house and uh, God's ark is out there in a tent I should do something about that Nathan told him that God didn't want him to build the temple that his son would kind of a tough message really for Nathan to deliver there because David didn't really want to hear that he wanted to do something big but he was told he wasn't to do that also it was Nathan the prophet who told David his secret sin with Bathsheba was known to God and that he must repent ah, that must have been a tough one to deliver as well uh, sometimes you know you called upon to say difficult things on behalf of the Lord but uh, not often as difficult as that that's a, a real tough one um, Nathan God's prophet almost the definition of reliability very reliable man very capable man and he would do what the Lord wanted at whatever the cost to himself it's kind of like Joab uh, in that Joab would do anything to promote himself only Nathan would do anything to promote God so Nathan sort of like the polar opposite really of, uh, of Joab Shimmy uh, appears on the list this is somebody else that uh, uh, Adonijah didn't bother going to Shimmy we're not too sure who this might have been uh, the name uh, is said that it might have been a different form of the name of one of David's brothers he could have been a brother of David maybe one of the mighty men we're not absolutely sure because we don't strictly there's there's a few people called Shimmy but this particular guy we're not really sure exactly who he is Ray R-E-I Ray we don't have any even any suggestions um, regarded uh, regarding a corrupted name here we have literally no idea who Ray uh, was but he was significant enough at the time to have been mentioned well you know what Adonijah didn't look for Shimmy's support he didn't look for Ray's support that's strange isn't it well we don't even know who they are that's a, a reminder to us isn't it that um, today's famous person is tomorrow's who was that uh, it mentions David's special guard uh, these are his special forces um, we've seen already that they're under the command of Benaiah uh, but uh, they remained loyal to the king 
perhaps as, as you would expect. What a bunch of people. Um, we might not say that they were all the same, but they did all seem to know the difference between right and wrong. At that time, that was what mattered, especially to David. A priest, a soldier, and a prophet. A couple of less well-known people and the guard that were closest to the king. I wonder if this reminds you at all of the mixed company of men Jesus selected to be with him through his ministry. He made what looked like some very strange choices, yet the men seemed to gel together and they got the job done. Very strange that the Lord should have picked such wildly different people and yet there they all were. Uh, here's the difference in the groups. A sense of right and wrong. Um, we hope that uh, both groups having that sense of right and wrong. We hope that the Old Testament group here, um, their understanding of it was born of a faith and a love for God. But if not, certainly there seemed to be a love for the king and loyalty there. Uh, we would imagine that the priest and the prophet had a love for God. Um, we don't know about the soldiers. Uh, what was that? What was going on in Gethsemane when all the disciples ran away? What was going on then? Where was the loyalty then? Where was the ability to stick with him then when it seemed as though there were dark forces against him? They all ran away. Where is the loyalty in us? We don't have another option of king set before us. We don't have Roman soldiers coming for our master. We have... Um, a slight inclination to do the wrong thing. And temptation, sometimes small, sometimes great, all of it is resistible. New Testament tells us that we can resist every temptation. The Lord will give us grace to do that. But we don't, do we? We fall to temptation all the time. Our loyalty is not always unquestioning. Our loyalty can sometimes waver a bit. I wonder if um, Sunday morning or Wednesday evenings might seem like a bit of an effort for you. Uh, maybe a bit much to come out. Uh, but do we all <clears throat> take the steps that we can take to make the most of the experience of worship? Would we benefit if we're watching the service by sitting in a more comfortable chair so we don't Jiffle about a lot, or would it be better for us if we sat in a less comfortable chair and don't fall asleep? Um, should we put our phones down if we're watching this on TV? Concentrate a bit more on what's going on. Should we give more to the Lord in order to receive more? Oh, I don't know if I got anything out of that. Well, how much did you give to it? How much did you give to the Lord? The Lord doesn't invite us to his church or to these gatherings so that we will get. He's asking us to give worship, and in so doing, then we receive blessing. This is a question of giving to God what is God's. Jesus was big on that. Give to Caesar what Caesar, but do give to God what is God's, the praise and the worship due to him from our hearts. Anyway, the first group made their choices, and so did the second. There were those who... He was going to look to, and there were those who wasn't even going to bother to ask to support him. Now, that's what happened initially. What happened next? What happened next? Adonijah sacrificed sheep, cattle, and fattened calves at the stone of Zaheles, which might sound fairly innocent. There's a massive great big stone. Uh, oh, that kind of like stands out a bit. I'll offer some sacrifices there. But actually, it wasn't that innocent. This is thought to be uh, a Canaanite site of worship. So actually, he's not king. 
He wants to be king, but if he does become king, it's pretty obvious that he's going to be leading them into idolatry. Even before he's begun, he's sending out the signals as to the direction he's going to go in. And uh, we are assuming that he wasn't a complete stranger to all of these people. All of these people would have known him, uh, the people on the lists that we've been talking about, and they would have known his inclinations. They would have known the direction that he was going to take things in. Maybe that accounts to some degree why they didn't all support him. He invited his brothers to this pagan knees up uh, and uh, the king's officials as well, and they all came. But he neglected to ask those others already mentioned. Once again, Nathan is the man who stands up and speaks up and he says what needs to be said. He does that because he's God's man and it's not about having a safe life. It's about doing what God wants me to do. So that's what he does. And he goes to the queen, Queen Bathsheba, uh, several queens in those days, but Bathsheba was one of them. He tells the queen that her life and that of her son are in danger as Adonijah has declared himself king. They're going to be in danger because if Adonijah makes himself king, he's going to have a clear out, get rid of everybody else who might think that they have uh, a claim to the throne. And so that clarifies that he is the boss and, and nobody should mess with him. So, yeah, he was right to tell the, the queen that she was going to be in danger. David still has no idea what's going on. Um, even Nathan hasn't told him. He's just in complete ignorance. Uh, but Nathan has a plan how best to approach the subject. He tells Bathsheba to remind David that he had promised to make Solomon king after he had passed. You go to David, you tell him uh, that that's what he said. But there's something that Bathsheba has to do in order to speak to the king. In verse 16, we read there, Bathsheba bowed down, prostrating herself before the king. This is not exactly the same as coming before the, uh, uh, the, uh, the emperor uh, in the, the time of um, Esther. Uh, you know, he was a despotic leader who, uh, you know, it was life and death all the time with him. People died, their lives were very cheap. David wasn't like that, but it was the conventional thing to do to, to bow down, uh, prostrating herself before the king. Uh, later on, uh, we read in verse 22, Nathan arrived and he came before the king. Nathan, the prophet, is here. So he went before the king, verse 22, and bowed with his face to the ground. There's a lot of difference between that and uh, trembling to come into the presence of the king. Anyway, so there's the respect. Um, and this is what's going on. But you've got to see this in verse 15. Um, Bathsheba went to see the aged king in his room where Abishag the Shunammite was attending him. Now, I know things were quite uh, unsophisticated in those days, but people still had feelings. Bathsheba comes uh, with respect, but she's not going to be thrilled to see Abishag there. She's going to be looking out for her son Solomon, She's going to be looking out for her own life. And in order to do that, she has to have a bit of humiliation. David is now a man of about 80 years. And we might have imagined Bathsheba to have been about the same age, that Bathsheba could have been about 80 as well, but maybe not. Uh, 1 Kings 3 verse 7 tells us uh, Solomon called himself a little child. A little child. That's two chapters later on. He calls himself a little child, no doubt in modesty, but he must have felt himself relatively young to the others in his position. One extra biblical authority, something that's not in the Bible, but from history, said he was 12 when he came to the throne. And we might say Bathsheba, if that was the case, might have been maybe in her 50s. Uh, David there, about 80, Bathsheba maybe in her 50s. And here she is, uh, she steps into the room and she sees her husband, her aged husband, 
with a girl maybe about 20 years younger than her, keeping him warm all night. If we respect the truth and honesty and try to do the right thing, as with all these friends of David did, if we're going to be serious about doing great and necessary things, we'll probably find it will come at some cost to us personally, as it did to Bathsheba. If we do the right thing, usually that does have a consequence to us. Are we going to be prepared for that? Are we going to be prepared to sacrifice in order to do the right thing? In Mark 10, Jesus told the rich young ruler, Jesus looked at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. That man was defined by his wealth. He has been spoken of, written of for 2000 years. And what does he get called? The rich young ruler. He was the rich young ruler. Jesus said, get rid of your richness. Something that defines you as a person. He can't imagine what it'd be like to be that crippled man who's there at the temple gate begging all day. He doesn't know what it's like because he's rich. He's got everything. Jesus says, give it all away. Don't let yourself be defined by what you hold in your hand or the experience that you have. Be defined by me, Jesus says. Don't be a white Christian. Don't be a black Christian. Don't be an Asian Christian. Be a Christian. Don't be rich and be a Christian. Don't be poor as a Christian. Don't be that ill person or disabled person who's a Christian. Be a Christian. Be defined by that. Paul visited Antioch, a place of persecution for himself. And when he's there, he speaks up to the church in Acts 14, 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Yeah, so people say, you know, becoming a Christian, it's a really easy thing to do. Yeah, well, becoming a Christian actually enters you into um, a life of many tribulations. And um, that's what it is. Uh, I read to you that uh, strange reading from Matthew at the beginning of it all because it had the verse in it that um, is often quoted on this subject, that we need to take up our cross and follow him. That's what we need to do. And we've got... Um, We've got some people who are prepared to do that in the story and other people who were looking out for themselves. And you don't want to be on the wrong team and you don't want to find yourself doing the wrong thing. May God help us to follow after him, to walk in obedience, even if it's costly to us. We're going to look uh, next week and see what happened when um, Bathsheba spoke to David and Nathan came in. We'll see what happened there. Well, may the Lord help us to see and understand those things. We're going to sing a hymn that relates to that now. Number 319. Number 319. Oh, uh-huh. 
Father, that's quite a thing to say, uh, that we'd rather have Jesus than anything that the world can give us, because the world can give us just so much these days. And uh, we're living in a very, very much a position of, of privilege, that um, we should be able to lay our hands upon so much. And as with the privilege, so goes the responsibility and the responsibility not to lay our hands on everything that's going Help us, Lord, to prioritise the Lord Jesus. Help him to be first in our lives. Help us to serve him with a glad and sincere heart. Pray that you'd help us to be faithful to you and to your dear cause. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, I'm sorry that um, we didn't actually get to see face-to-face -face this week at the church, people who were, who were going to come to the service. But uh, you saw me anyway. Um, yeah, we'll be back on, on the internet on Wednesday night. Uh, Bible study in Acts. Looking forward to that then. Bye-bye. Hello.